Hello and welcome to Free Voices, an interview series of the Institute of Public Affairs. I'm Morgan Begg, the Director of Research at the Institute of Public Affairs, and today I'm joined by Amul Thapar, who joins us from the United States, where he serves as a judge on the Sixth Circuit of the United States Court of Appeals. He's also the author of a new book, The People's Justice, Clarence Thomas and the Constitutional Stories that Defines Him, which explores conservative legal ideas through the words and opinions of the great Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. Judge Thapar, welcome. Well, thank you for having me. Oh, it's great to have you and I appreciate you giving us your time today. And uh, as further background to your uh, long and successful legal career is you are notably one of the very first appointments that Donald Trump made uh, to the Court of Appeals, the very first appointment to the Court of Appeals uh, in 2017. Uh, and your cohort of judicial appointments was seen as a, a, a significant infusion of legal conservatism into the US judiciary. Uh, what does legal conservatism mean to you? Yeah, I mean, I think legal conservatism, we don't love those labels. Uh, I think there's a significant number of originalists on the court. And what that means is we believe that originalists reach legal results, not conservative results or liberal results. They re reach results compelled by the language of the law. In other words, more rule of law people. Yeah, and do you think, uh, is it true that the, the courts have become much more originalist uh, in the time since 2017? That is a fair statement. I think both the Supreme Court itself and the lower courts have had an infusion of originalist judges. And as a result, they've become more originalist. But also, originalism has taken heed in the United States. It's really a, a judicial philosophy that's kind of caught fire in many ways. And as I like to say, if you think about the philosophies today of law and interpretation in the United States, there's originalism and there's originalism's critics. Mm -hmm. There's really no other leading philosophy. There's living constitutionalism, there's common good constitutionalism, yeah. there's different types of things that people have thrown out, but it, originalism's really the king on the hill. And many judges, even uh, judges appointed by the other party now, say they are originalist, or at least they're, they're in good faith trying to do originalism. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. And uh, what's really interesting in the Australian context, I've made the observation in the past that Australian courts now appear to be in the position that the American courts were in the 1970s, where the text of the constitution is a sort of long forgotten uh, memory of the past, uh, and the progressivism is a sort of unchallenged status quo. Uh, but clearly, something happened in America that changed this, uh, which hasn't happened in Australia. What, what happened in America and what lessons can Australia learn from that? You know, I think Ronald Reagan as president and took it seriously, the, what he felt was the runaway nature of the courts and where instead of the Republic being ruled by the executive and legislative and in turn the American people, as it should be, it was ruled by the courts, and he had great faith in the goodness of the American people. And so he appointed people like Justice Scalia, who then championed originalism and really brought originalism to where it is today. And Justice Thomas has obviously picked up that mantle and is probably the leading originalist on the court, is the leading originalist on the court, and maybe one of the greatest originalists ever to live. And they seem to have swayed a lot of younger judges to their perspective and it's really taken on uh, a movement of its own. It's, um, and, and what is it that Australia can do to replicate that? Yeah, I mean, you got to think about the nature of written law. If, if the legislature or the parliament in your instance is going to take the time, let's set the constitution aside for a second, to write, to negotiate and write down a law. That's a messy process and it's difficult. And they reach a meeting of the minds. For a judge to come in and then say they know better seems to get rid of you know, parliamentary law, uh, Republican law, like Republic law, Democratic law, and replaces it with judge-made law. And so if what we have by laws or the Constitution itself is a meeting of the minds and the terms of the meetings of the mind are reflected in the written document, it's incumbent on the judge to interpret those terms as they were understood at the time they were signed so we accurately reflect what the people want and not what we believe is best for them. 
Yes, it's uh, you know it's really this problem of judges seeing themselves as philosopher kings, sort of legislating from the bench. Um, right. It's uh, and it completely degrades our representative democracy. Yeah, and I like to tell a story that people grasp because when I was appointed to the district, so I was a district court judge for mm. ten years, which is a trial court judge in the United States. We separate our functions to trial judges and appeals judges. And President Bush appointed me to the trial court. And for 10 years, I was a trial judge. And then President Trump appointed me to the Court of Appeals. And when I, when I was nominated, I was the very first, other than Justice Gorsuch, I was the very first lower court judge nominated by President Trump. And the media did a lot of articles on me, and they called me an originalist. And I said, guilty as charged. <laughs> but my neighbor, who was a dear friend, came running down. And he was a businessman. He didn't know anything about law, really hadn't thought about it. But he read in the paper that I was an originalist, and he said, Amul, Amul, how can you be one of those? And I said, Mike, one of what? And he said, an originalist. And I said, Mike, you're a businessman, right? And he said, yeah. And I said, so when you sign a contract with someone else, you have a meeting of the minds. And he said, yeah, of course. And you reflect that meeting of the minds in the written terms of the contract. Yep. And he said, that's correct. <laughs> and I said, let's say you have a dispute. Do you want the court to interpret the terms as you understood them to resolve your dispute? Or do you want us to tell you what we think is best for you, ignoring the terms of the contract and resolving your dispute that way? And he said, oh my gosh, of course you should interpret it consistent <laughs> with the terms of the contract. And I said, Mike, you two are an originalist now. And he ran up to his house like I was a wild animal. <laughs> That's terrific. Um, perhaps one of the problems, and you would referred to your nomination and appointment process, uh, you might be aware that it's very different in Australia. Uh, here, uh, the Attorney General uh, has a discretion over who to appoint to the judicial, a judicial office, uh, and that selection process takes place behind closed doors. Uh, and you would think, theoretically, that uh, a conservative-minded government might have, be uninhibited from appointing whoever they wanted uh, who believed in originalism or some other alternative conservative idea, uh, but we see that it doesn't actually happen. Uh, but in America, uh, we see that judges are required to obtain the approval of the Senate. Uh, and this is criticised, especially criticised in Australia, as politicising the process. Um, how would you, is that a fair characterization? Or how would you respond to that? I mean, we're only familiar with our process in the sense that that's what I've lived through. Mm. And I don't know that, it, I think in recent past, it has politicized the process. People will forget that in America, not that long ago, we didn't have hearings. Mm. So the president would nominate and the advice and consent, the Senate would vote without a hearing. You would vote on the credentials of the person being nominated. I would tell you, of course, all judges would prefer that. I don't think hearings <laughs> produce anything that productive because senators, rightly so, want to know how you would answer certain questions. And judges, rightly so, say, I can't tell you that. Justice Ginsburg famously, we call it the Ginsburg principle, um, said, look, we can't forecast because we can't, A, we don't know without re reviewing the case, reading the briefs, doing all the things we do. And so I think it's a, a tug of war that doesn't result in anything productive. It's kind of a stalemate where the Senate wants to know, A, judges can't tell them A, so judges tell them B, and no one's happy, yeah. right? And so the reality is, is I think presidents should nominate, um, and in an ideal world, people would get voted up or down based on their credentials and abilities. Yep. Oh, I think that's. I think it's very reasonable to me, but it's. Uh, it seems to be a tough message uh, in Australia. <laughs> yeah. um, one of the most significant cases in recent years uh, was the, the the decision of the Supreme Court in Dobbs and Jackson Women's Health Centre, uh, which and you can explain some of the details if you like. But I just thought it was uh, notable uh, in that in that majority judgment, which overturned Roe v. Wade, uh, you were actually cited in a case that was in a dissenting judgment of yours a year earlier, um, criticizing the Roe v. Wade precedent. Uh, would you like to discuss? Yeah, I mean, my decision concurred in part and dissented in part. And what that means is I agreed that Roe was the law of mm. the land and I had to follow it, and I did. Mm. Um, I then dissented on a different issue about void for vagueness, whether the statute was clear, whether the law itself was clear such that 
people could understand it, and I thought it was. Um, and the majority thought it wasn't, so they struck down the entire law, whereas I would have just complied with Roe. But what I went on to do is I analyzed um, whether Roe was correctly decided. Mm. And what the history revealed is that Roe was pretty much made up, as the Supreme Court later recounted in Dobbs, and there was this memo that went around without any legal or even in part factual basis, the means memo, um, that was the genesis for Roe v. Wade. And so the point being is what the Supreme Court, and you know, the American people are learning to love and hate it, both conservatives and liberals now. What the Supreme Court did is it reached a legal result. It decided that the right to abortion was not in the Constitution itself, not in the words of the document, and thus left to the American people to decide. And we're seeing that play out in the United States today, where People are putting it on ballots and they're voting on it. And that is that is how democracy works. It's messy, but it gives the American people a say versus unelected judges that are unaccountable to the people. I think that's the key point is uh, however you feel about the actual issue uh, that was considered uh, is that it was a, uh, an issue that was properly left to legislatures who were accountable to the people to decide. That's right. Uh, but, you know, judges, and in many different areas have assumed that right for themselves. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I, I liked about your judgment, and I see this uh, especially in uh, judgments of Clarence Thomas as well, uh, is this uh, recognition of bad precedent and being unhesitant in challenging and calling out bad precedent. Um, you know, we have a big problem I see in Australia where even uh, judges who have a conservative disposition uh, will simply uh, comply with the precedent on the, on the, on the principle that, oh, we, you know, we don't want to intervene uh, and we're just going to reinforce previous judgments. But the problem is, especially in Australia, uh, we have decades of bad precedent that have been reinforced again and again over time. Um, would you like to comment on, you know, just that, what is it, like, is it really that hard just to challenge precedent? <laughs> no, I think it's important for judges to pick and choose their fights and find the cases that are really causing problems and then lay out why it's wrong. It doesn't mean you don't call something out as wrong. You don't have to write like I did in Memphis Center, the precursor to Dobbs, a long opinion explaining why it's wrong. Sometimes it's called for. Sometimes you can just point out, look, for the reasons I've given before or that other judges have given before, this is wrong and we should revisit it. And here's why it's wrong. You can do it in a simple way. But I think, you know, different judges have different views on it. But I think when I took the oath, I took an oath to this Constitution. I took an oath to the Constitution of the United States and laws of the United States. And when I feel like they're being misinterpreted or the courts got it wrong, I feel like it's my duty to say so doesn't mean I, sometimes I don't know and I start to do research the first time I see it. So the first time I may not say it's wrong. I may just follow it, but I may start thinking about it and then do the work to figure out if it's right or wrong. And I think it's important that judges do that. So we get the law back to where it should be and I'll leave to the people the right to govern themselves. Yeah, I think it's, uh, well, I just think it's so important. And ultimately in, that, in the Dobbs case, you have indicated uh, you, the, the dissent that, or the, the comments that you had made in the lower court were essentially uh, vindicated by the superior court. Um, but you need to have that discussion first. Right. Yeah. You, and I think it's important in the lower courts that we flag what's causing problems. We lay out for the Supreme Court where their precedent is problematic because it gives them something so they can see where they think, where we think they need to take a look. And I think that's helpful to them. And just turning uh, to your book now, um, something that really comes through uh, in the cases that you write about uh, is how it challenges this old myth that uh, originalism or what I, what I might call you know, conservative legal ideas um, are merely a tool to empower the strong against the weak, uh, the big guy against the little guy, the rich against the poor. Um, but time and again, uh, you know, so many of the individuals you write about seem surprised that, oh, the progressive judges lined up behind the powerful uh, again and again. Um, should this really be a surprise? I don't know about that. I think what's 
more surprising to people is how often originalism favors the little guy and how it protects people from predatory governments, from predatory corporations and things like that. And you see it in the stories in the book. The book, you know, The People's Justice is 12 kind of stories of 12 cases. And I think people in Australia, America, around the world will see firsthand if you read it that it's not written for lawyers. It's written for ordinary people to understand what government's about, to understand what originalism's about. And I try to make it in a way that's interesting to read. And I think most people have found it very interesting to read. And you see the stories and the, the human drama of what's going on. You see how originalism impacts everyday lives. And I think it proves what you just said, that the opposite of what people think is true, that it actually favors the little guy in almost all instances over its government, because that was the point is to protect people from their government and things like well, that. I mean, it, it seems rational because the the idea of the Constitution, both here and in America, is the limitation of the scope of government power. That's right. Um, so, of course, uh, a conservative sort of approach to that is going to rightly limit that power. And that was the point of constitutions. It is to give the government certain limited power and keep everything else in the people. Yeah. And I think originalism reflects that and as a result of reflecting it it protects us from our government and everything else well and not just uh not just the government uh i'd like to just because i found this case so fascinating uh kilo and connecticut uh which right. was a case in wherein uh, the government uh, i believe the state government at the time exercised its power to seize the property of you know a homeowners uh, in order to essentially give it to a private corporation. To give it to Pfizer use, Corporation. To fi the Pfizer Corporation on the basis that uh, this was, uh, and you can lay out some more of the detail, but on the basis that this had a public uh, public purpose. Uh, but this this language doesn't actually appear in the Constitution. Right, that's right. In the <laughs> so what happened is Suzette Kilo and her neighbours lived in this beautiful blue collar neighbourhood. Um, they didn't want to give it up. Some had lived there 100 years. And you notice the government never comes and takes the rich neighborhood. Uh, when they wanted Pfizer to come to town and they had a mill site for Pfizer, Pfizer wanted, you know, a development. They wanted hotels. They wanted uh, executive office building. And they needed this neighborhood to be gone. And so what the Constitution in America says, the government can take it for your property for public use with just compensation, meaning for a sidewalk mm. or for a sliver of your land for a road or in the most extreme circumstance, your entire land for a railroad that the public will use. Well, in the 1950s, the D.C. City Council decided to take a neighborhood, a poorer neighborhood, but one that was interracial and had um, some vibrance to it and give it to a private developer. And the Supreme Court, when the, the residents challenged that taking, the Supreme Court said it was okay because it was for a public purpose, meaning they were gonna give it to a private developer and the, nice, the city was gonna get nicer. And that was a public purpose, meaning they were gonna run out the poor and give it to the rich. And that was a problem, but the Supreme Court said, no, no problem. And they changed the words because you can't give it to a private developer and argue it's a public use and so they changed it to public purpose. Well, when Suzette Kilo and her neighbors challenged this in the Supreme Court, when Pfizer was taking it, they argued that Pfizer's purpose was not a public purpose. They didn't argue go back to the original meaning of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. But there was an organization that did, the NAACP. And the NAACP pushed for that because they argued that this practice historically, and they proved it, it was a great brief, uh, was used to prey on poor and minority neighborhoods and throw those people out, the indignity of throwing them out and giving them bare pennies on the dollar and calling it fair compensation. And then they couldn't even afford a new house because of inflation and how property values escalate and definitely not a new house in an area like they lived in. Often these are nice neighborhoods, but blue collar neighborhoods. And so and this is where you see gentrification throughout the United States, where the government's coming in and running the poor out. And it was extremely troubling. It went all the way to the Supreme Court, and Suzette and her neighbors lost. And Justice Thomas wrote a dissent, and he pointed out how 
absurd this was, that the Constitution was being rewritten to prey on these people. He pointed out how it often resulted in poorer neighborhoods and minority neighborhoods being run out. Um, and he pointed out that they don't have the political power to stop this and the indignity of being thrown out of their home by a government that is supposed to be there to protect them. And Pfizer came and eight years later they left. And as you can see, yeah. see in the book, there's a picture and uh, I went and visited recently where uh, Suzette's neighborhood once stood and today it's an empty field. Yeah, and there's if Suzette's house, that. and there's her neighborhood today, and an empty field filled by weeds and rubble and feral cats. Yeah, it's just it's despicable, and uh, and the, the the progressive judges who like to hold themselves out as uh, you know, standing for the the little guy, well, they all lined up behind the big government, big corporation. Uh, right, because they said they collusion. should defer the public purpose. We'll yeah. just defer to the government to yeah. know what the public's purpose is. And as Justice Thomas pointed out, we never defer to the government when they're invading your rights. We <laughs> decide. The court decides. I mean, this is the role of the courts is right. to determine where those rights are being infringed. So, yeah. um, of course, it, it just. I think it really just highlights just this uh, utter activism and you know just rewriting of the law from the bench uh, and how destructive that is. And, and that usually results in the little guy losing. And if you look at in, in the book, the chapter I think a lot of people would be surprised by is the chapter about Bill Cosby and who stood up mm. for the victims of Bill Cosby. That was Clarence Thomas. Clarence Thomas. And yep. Again, you can read about it, about Kathy McKee, this remarkable woman and what she went through. But, um, you know, that's the thing. The stories are so compelling. And Clarence Thomas truly is the people's justice. Why? He cares about the people's constitution. He cares about the people's law and he cares about the people themselves and his opinions reflect it. I, I just want to turn to uh, some more other modern developments uh, in American law. Um, I think a big, maybe one of the bigger cases this year that we witnessed at the IPA where uh, passionate believers in freedom of speech, um, we're very concerned about concepts such as misinformation, which um, are contradictory to free speech principles. Uh, we had the decision of Murphy and Missouri, which was handed down by the Supreme Court this year. Uh, and this was a case in which, uh, broadly speaking, uh, the, it tested the government's power to essentially what they call jawbone uh, social media companies to apply uh, sort of non-legal pressure to censor content according to what they consider to be misinformation. Um, but the Supreme Court decided against uh, the free speech advocates in that case. Um, I, I'm just interested in your thoughts about well, how you saw that. that they truly decided against them as much as remanded for the circuits to take another look, which they do sometime. I agree with you. They um, in one case, they vacated, as I recall, both the Fifth and the Eleventh Circuits, who had conflicting views, mm -hmm. and sent it back for uh, the courts to take another look under their test, which they do sometimes. And so uh, I think the courts are still struggling with that. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say that the Supreme Court has decided it. And you know, we'll see what comes of the Fifth and Eleventh Circuits, but it's back in the lower courts, and I can't really comment beyond that because it's an ongoing case. Of course. But I think, uh, you know, those are issues now the courts are grappling with. Yep. Um, another recent development uh, that I find interesting is that some courts, uh, the Supreme Court and, uh, and other judges at various levels have adopted something that's been called the a history and tradition test. Uh, yes. And this has been described as, you know, you know, in very dark and ominous terms by the New York Times and others as a, a new standard that guides judges to make decisions or restore prior precedent, which aligns with the, the history and traditions of the American founding. Uh, is this a, do you think this is a repackaging of originalism or is this something new? No, I think it's just, I guess you could call it a repackaging, but I think what the Supreme Court is trying to do 
is, and you saw in Bruin where they talked about history and tradition, and then in Rahimi where they further refined it, and these are two cases from the U.S. Supreme Court. And I think what the Supreme Court's trying to do, right, there's two things. There's the theory of originalism, the principles we talked about at the beginning, and then there's making originalism work in the lower courts. And I think what they're doing is we've moved past the theory where everyone kind of is operating in the United States on a theory of originalism, and now we're trying to make it workable, and how do you apply the test? What do you look to? They're giving guidance to figure out the original meaning. That's all they're doing is they're giving the lower courts guidance, and they're telling us, look, look to history, look to the text, start with the text in history, but you can also look to the traditions that underlie that text in history. Because think about it, to understand text, you have to understand the context it was passed in. And to understand context, you have to understand history and tradition. So it makes perfect sense. So I guess you could call it a repackaging. I guess you could call it, okay, we, everyone's got the theory of originalism now. We're original public meeting originalists. How do we do it? Well, here are the things you lower courts should look to. And at first, after Bruin, everyone thought it had to be a specific law. And then in Rahimi, they said, no, no, no. You look to the principles that the traditions outlie, and you apply those principles to today's practices. And that makes it much easier. Now, uh, with... Uh spoken at length here about the role of the judge and the role of the judge is to find the law, is to take out those value judgments as much as possible and find what does the law actually say and what does it actually mean. Uh, and I'd just like to ask you something about that recently came to my attention in a report uh, that was published by the American Energy Institute that found that a green lobby group called the Climate Judiciary Group has briefed more than 2,000 judges across the United States on a, quote, educational curriculum prepared by those who openly support litigation against the energy industry on matters relating to energy law and uh, litigation. Um, I just thought this was staggering. Uh, how is this common in America? Uh, and what does it say about the modern judiciary that uh, it appears to be susceptible in a, this kind of activism? Well, I don't know that it's fair to say the modern judiciary is susceptible to that kind of activism. What I would say is in the federal system, which I'm familiar with, if we attend a judicial education institute, we have to post it. And that means the whole public can know if we attend that. So my hunch is you're not going to find many federal judges that have attended it. But if they did, they'll have posted it. And everyone knows. And I, I think that's fair. I think if you want to be educated on a subject, say artificial intelligence, uh, it's something that's right. Courts in the United States right now are struggling with, and we're not going to be educated by each other because none of us. I mean, maybe there's a few of us. My colleague John Nalbandian knows a little bit about artificial intelligence, but I'm I am not someone that knows, right? And so, if someone wants to provide an education seminar, and we tell the public, hey, we're going to this education seminar now. For example, I'll give you an example of one that I go to. It's not an educational seminar as much, but I speak at a mass tort conference. It's both the plaintiff's bar and the defense bar. So I think that's important for the federal judiciary that when you go to something like that, both sides are represented. This is it. And they can educate you on what you need to know in order to decide the cases, like maybe give you the agreed science uh, that will help you learn. I think that is not a bad thing, but I think the key is is that it's out there. Everyone knows about it. Um, I don't know about the specifics of what you're talking about. I don't know if they're doing it in the state courts versus the federal court. I imagine I would have heard of it if it was in the federal court. But what I can assure you is if it's in the federal court, my colleagues who have gone have filled that out on the website and you can look it up. Uh, and I just, want to, just wanted to round it, uh, bring it back around to Australia um, and just seeking more lessons from the United States because I think this is so important that we make, uh, that we adopt this movement and this, these new ideas uh, to restore the meaning of the Constitution. Um, I know in America, a lot of the movement began on university campuses, in the law schools, in organisations such as the Federalist Society. Um, is, that, is that an organisation uh, 
were you involved in the law school? Is that how you found uh, originalism? How did you find originalism? I, I found it in law school by studying and wondering, you know, when I first heard what we were doing in law school, I thought it was policy, not law. And I thought, ah, I could have gone to the public policy school and got two years of education to save myself a lot of money versus going to law school, which is three years in America, like here in Melbourne. Uh, or Melbourne, I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, I'm getting there. <laughs> but the reality is, is that I think what's important for Australians today is to learn from our lessons. And I think that's happening, right? So the Federalist Society provided another voice. It provided a diversity of viewpoint in that it sponsored debates, which weren't happening on law school campuses between people of different views so you could get both sides. I think the Samuel Griffith Society in Australia is trying to do that here today, and it's so important. And then there's books like The People's Justice that I think can help Australians see what originalism really is versus what the media tells them it is. And you know, you can get it on Amazon, you can get it wherever, but The People's Justice helps you understand what originalism's all about. And it gives you the other side that isn't being told. And it gives you the other side, not through my words, but through the words of the cases and through Justice Thomas's actual words in the case and the stories of the litigants that appeared in front of it. So I, I uh, attended university law school, you know, between 10 and 15 years ago. Uh, I don't think I ever heard the word originalism, uh, although, of course, you know, through my own study, I, I found it. But I think that's beginning to change now. I think Australia is taking that first step into a better conception of the law. And I think it's so important that uh, that you're touring Australia to share this message and publishing books such as The People's Justice uh, to really better inform the next generation of legal professionals in Australia. So I just wanted to thank you again for your time uh, joining me today and, and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your time in Australia. Thank you. I love it here. The people are great and I have great faith and hope for the Aus uh, Australian people like I do the American people. I think they're very similar in many ways. Agreed. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>